thanks very much, everyone, for coming on this cold day um, out to uh, what, what is our last um, brown bag sponsored by the Institute for European Studies here at IU for the semester. Uh, we'll have more next semester, and I invite you to take a look on our website to, to take a look at them. We're, we're coming, bringing those together. And if it, I also put the uh, advertisement on if any of you in this room have research broadly on, on Europe, modern Europe, um, historical experiences in Europe that you might be interested in, in sharing with others through a brown bag, please let us know and we can work you into our schedule. We have a few open spots for the spring. Um, we're we're uh, happy to welcome today uh, uh, Gunter Yikili, um, Kelly, sorry, is the uh, to, uh, today to speak on his work. Um, Gunter is the Justin M. Druck Family Scholar at the Institute uh, of Contemporary Anti-Semitism in the Born's Jewish Studies Program here uh, this year. Uh, his interests are in the history of anti-Semitism, racism, discrimination, and education, and in Jewish-Muslim relations. Uh, his most recent book, which I've had a little bit of a look at, and I'm anxious to read uh, in depth, is called European Muslim Anti-Semitism, which analyzes the patterns of, of argumentation used by young Muslims to justify negative views of Jews. Uh, and today he'll be speaking about the new wave of Juda Judeophobia in Western Europe, a threat to Jews in general society. Um, and please take it away. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for inviting me to this uh, Europe Brown Bag um, uh, debates. Uh, I have um, attended some of these, and uh, I think it's it's really a uh, great discussion culture that I have experienced here in my last three months at IU. Um, so yeah, I'm really happy to to use this uh, to discuss um, this topic with you. And we are a small group now, so I think we can do it in a more informal way. So if you have questions, just don't hesitate to ask them uh, even directly. So we have an hour, so <coughs> I prepared a talk for uh, 30 to 40 minutes. Um, but I'm happy to go into discussions as soon as you uh, want to. Um, the topic of um, new wave of anti-Semitism or Jodiophobia um, in Europe. Um, the debates about it have, um, uh, have risen as well in the last years, and not only with the um, uh, terrorist uh, attacks in, uh, in Toulouse, in Brussels, in Paris, and elsewhere. Um, but the, there is, what we can observe, there is anxiety among larger parts of Jewish communities, uh, in Europe certainly, but also in the US, I think, uh, many um, worry what is happening um, in Europe. So I would we'll try to give an overview uh, to, uh, to see what is happening, what can we observe um, to put a little bit into historical context as well, I think this is important. Um, because it's not a new phenomenon. You all know that true hatred is nothing really new to Europe. Um, and it has often come in waves, different waves. Um, we have seen that often during this waves of anti-Semitism, there was a time when there was instability and uh, also then maybe led to greater violence. Um, not sure whether this is, is this is the case now in, in Europe. I, I would be hesitant to, to um, draw quick conclusions on that. Um, and authorities are of course important when it comes to, uh, to violent forms of anti-Semitism. Um, and authorities throughout history have taken different positions in different countries, but usually they were at least um, they tried to limit riots, often in their own interest. And what we see, uh, that was not always the case, as we know, in the, uh, um, in the Holocaust, even though the Nazis, also the Nazis tried to limit riots, but they organized the anti-Semitic violence and that sort of themselves. So this is very different um, from what we see today. All the major European governments um, uh, 
try to, I think, most but do what they can to protect Jewish communities, certainly, and also to curb uh, anti-Semitism. Um, and so it, I think it's very wrong to compare the, the recent wave of Judophobia uh, to anything what happened in the first part of the first half of the 20th century. Um, however, what we what what some thought that after the Holocaust we would be spared of any anti-Semitic developments in Europe. This is um, I think that was an illusion from the beginning. Um, and um, it certainly turned out to be wrong. We still, we still uh, see anti-Semitism, um, and it's, I, I don't think it's very surprising, um, because the end of the Second World War, uh, there were the same people with the same thoughts about Jews. Um, they were not allowed to act upon it, uh, openly, but um, the same people, and um, nothing fundamentally changed um, after the Holocaust in the European societies. So it's not surprising that um, there is still anti Semitism. But when we talk about the rise of anti Semitism, well, how do we know that's really a rise? No. Most scholars who work on this don't dispute this anymore, but um, it's still, I think still we have to um, look into the, um, into the evidence. What do we have to really say that there is a rise uh, today? So how can we observe it? We can have a look on statistics of anti-Semitic incidents, and these statistics are often not very good. They are good in two or three major European countries. They're good in France and they're good in, in the UK. But even then, it's difficult. These numbers come from police. And if a policeman or woman uh, classifies an incident as anti-Semitic or not, is how do they do it? So um, it's, it's these numbers. Well, we, we have some numbers there. We can into look into um, the public discourse and newspapers, media in general, and see if there's a, if anti-Semitic tropes are more frequent or more aggressive. Um, and there are many who say that there has been a development of, of a more open anti-Semitic discourse in, in recent years. Um, we can also ask Jews, Jewish communities, about their experiences, how they feel, and we have seen that there, um, that in France, in Britain, and also in Germany, uh, to some extent, but less, um, Jewish students in public schools um, go to private schools, either Jewish or Catholic schools. Um, because of one of the reasons, um, at least in some uh, in many cases, um, is the anti-Semitic everyday anti-Semitic incidents they face in school, and they don't want to um, they don't want to be this. Um, and we also see that there's a rise of um, of uh, um, immigration <coughs> of the Jewish communities. Many go. Um, to uh, Israel, but also to other countries. But um, those <coughs> who go from Europe to Israel, we have the statistics because the Israeli authorities, they keep track of these numbers. Um, then we see that there is there are attacks on uh, Holocaust commemoration and remembrance, verbally and physically, um, that we've seen in and this is a, a very important um, trope or expression of anti-Semitism today in Europe, uh, attacking Holocaust remembrance in many ways. 
And this is also not a surprise um, because it is, um, um, well, we can maybe discuss this later on why that might be. And then we have um, over the past um, 10 uh, years or so a rise of, um, of terrorist threats and um, coming from mostly from uh, Islamists, but not only. We have, for example, in Germany in 2003, there was a, um, the Kameradschaft uh, Süd, so the neo-Nazi group. Um, they um, wanted to bomb um, the uh, when the Jewish community of uh, the Jewish community center of um, of Munich that was about to be built, and they planned the bomb or wanted to plant a bomb there uh, in 2003. So the terrorist threat does not only come from Islamist terrorists, but mainly in, in recent years. Um, and this is, of course. Um, uh, very influential, even though the numbers um, are relatively uh, low. But imagine, for example, the uh, terrorist um, jihadist attack in Toulouse in 2012. Um, probably all know that that Mohamed um, um, Mera, who, who um, described himself as a uh, Muslim warrior, a jihadist. Um, he went to a school, Jewish school in Toulouse, and shot a teacher and his two children and another uh, young, very young student um, at close range. And this is is um, is very influential, as an has a has a huge impact because um, when um, when you have children and um, you uh, um, uh, Jewish parents have um, they have children and they think okay I can send my children to a public school and if there are any problems I can always take my child and there are private schools there's a Jewish school there's a Catholic school maybe but if if then there is the impression that my children are not safe anymore in school, this has a huge psychological impact. So this had an impact on Jewish communities all over Europe in 2012. Um, it was not taken very seriously by um, the general population, so we didn't see any mass demonstrations against this um, violence. Uh, and also the uh, politicians um, in different uh, countries uh, elect to take this as a serious incident. There's um, famously Ashton, uh, she was then the European, what was the position? Do we know. Uh, Foreign Affairs. Foreign Affairs. Uh, and she didn't even, um, well she, it took her some time to, um, to say that that was an anti Semitic incident. <laughs> Um, so, what we see, I mean, the security uh, threat is uh, not only against uh, Jews, as we've seen very recently, um, also against um, police and soldiers. Mohamed Mera, before he went to the school, to the Jewish school, he shot three soldiers uh, that weren't on duty, um, but he selected them because there were soldiers, uh, French soldiers, um, and, and killed them. Um, and we've seen that also in, in other um, um, incidents. And also critics of Islam, or what's sometimes called uh, Islamophobes, are also threatened and have uh, to be protected. Charlie Hebdo is the most prominent uh, example. And of course, also the, the wider public. So what we see in France uh, today, but also in Brussels, in, in uh, Belgium, um, that there is a, a huge increase um, of security measures. Um, in, um, in France, there are still about 10,000 soldiers on the streets of, um, of um, uh, 
France, and, and half of them are protecting Jewish uh, schools um, and other institutions. And now you see, um, even in, well, when last year I was living in, in Toulouse, and in some, when you walk ar around the city, now you know where Jewish organizations are, because they're armed soldiers in front of them, um, heavily armed, and also in the uh, establishment, so in, in even in Jewish kindergartens, you have not only in front of these kindergartens armed soldiers, but also inside. Um, and that is a protection, but it, of course, gives also a message to the Jewish communities that is, they are protected, protected citizens, but is that then really their country, if they have to be uh, so much protected. But, um, yeah, this is uh, where we can discuss it, and it's still not clear. I mean, of course, the Jewish communities welcome um, security measures, most of them. Um, okay. um, so we have now, I was talking about incidents, the statistics about incidents, and I won't go too long into it, but we can <coughs> see this is for the UK, um, and this is the numbers come from the Community Security Trust in, in cooperation with the, um, with the British police. Um, but you see a rise there from the uh, 1990s um, to, um, uh, to more recent years. And this um, big shift from the 1990s to uh, the years 2000 is um, can be even seen better in the statistics from France, where you have that the numbers are about 10 times as high um, uh, today than uh, in the 1990s. So there's a big jump here, we can see. Um, and what we also can see that the, uh, that the percentage of the violent acts has increased. So the violence, not only the, the total numbers have increased, <coughs> but also the violent acts. And this is also an observation we can do for the UK. The violence has increased um, uh, against Jews. Um, what we can also see from these statistics that uh, in some years where there were, were um, <coughs> there was more uh, violence in the conflict between Palestinians and, uh, and Israel, um, that the numbers are higher, for uh, example, well, 2014, the latest, but also 2009. <coughs> um, but these are only peaks. So it stays even in years where there was relatively calm uh, in the Middle East or in the Palestinian Israeli conflict. It stays on a very high level. Um, and there is a study, that was study by, done by the European Union, the, the agency for, um, that observes discrimination, and they have done this kind of surveys for a uh, number of uh, minority groups, for Muslims, for uh, people with migrant background in general, um, and in 2012 they asked um, Jewish communities across um, um, different European uh, countries, eight European countries, um, how they, uh, their perception of anti-Semitism is. It's a bit small, the, I don't know if you can read it, but <coughs> there was, and that was one question um, they asked um, if the, if they think that the uh, level of anti-Semitism in their country has changed over the past five years. Uh, and they asked um, Jews in eight different countries. <coughs> um, there were about almost 6,000 participants in this survey. Um, and we see here that, when we take the example of France, that 74% uh, 
said that in these past five years, um, anti-Semitism, or the level of it, has increased a lot. Um, you see that also for Belgium, the numbers are almost uh, uh, 60%. In Germany, it's less, but still 30%. Uh, in the UK, uh, 27%. Um, and what I found also interesting is then, um, Jews were asked uh, what the nature of the anti-Semitism was they experienced. Um, they said that it's often stated that the Holocaust is this or has been exaggerated and so on forms of Holocaust denial um, they experience and they um, see as a rightly so as a form of, of anti-Semitism. Um, then you have uh, a large number, 74 percent who said that Jews or they experience this, <coughs> that Jews are responsible for the current economic crisis, this uh, trope they hear often, this stereotype. Um, <coughs> And then another one, also related to the Holocaust, um, that they hear that allegedly Jews exploit the Holocaust uh, victim <coughs> for their own purposes. Can I just interrupt with you? Yeah. This is not about the frequency of them hearing it. This is about whether this is about whether that would be an anti-Semitic. Is that correct? It's actually, is that, it's whether or not. So in other words, it's not. Do lots of people say to you <coughs> Jews are responsible for the current economic crisis? It's okay. were someone to say that Jews are responsible for the current economic crisis, would that for you count as anti-Semitic? Um, yeah. <laughs> yes, you, you see, you have the question down there. You have the question at the bottom of it. It is, in your opinion, would you consider a non-Jewish person to be anti-Semitic if he says right. that is anti-Semitic? You're right. But this is, you're right, this is, you have the question down here. Right. Okay. Gotcha. Um, but they they came up with the I mean the these um, unfortunately they have not yet released all the questionnaires mm -hmm. with their answers from every country. Mm -hmm. uh, I was ask, I've been asking them for this for two years now. Yeah. And uh, they do country reports, mm -hmm. and they have not, they don't uh, give any, out mm -hmm. any figures before they do the mm -hmm. country reports. So mm -hmm. we have to wait a little bit. And I mean, these, I take these as indications anyway, these, these um, uh, answers by, and this particular survey is also a difficult one because in Europe it is almost impossible to have uh, representative surveys uh, of Jews. because. I mean, in some countries, you can have it, but the numbers of Jews in, first of all, the numbers of Jews in different European countries are very small, so it's difficult to get representative figures anyway. And then you don't have um, data, enough data um, about the communities, because they, for example, in France, they do not allow uh, these statistics to be made um, because of historical reasons. Uh, not to single out of Jews, uh, but then it's very much diff it's very difficult to get accurate data and statistics. Um, so we should really be careful in generalizing it. I mean, they used it. They used an online survey, but they had six thousand people participating. This is such a number, so you can say something. It's not just a coincidence. But yeah, we have to be careful with these kind of figures. Yeah. Yeah. Anything on the survey tell you about what is? most prevalent in the eyes of European Jews? Where is the most prevalent you know, justification for anti-Semitism? This, really doesn't, this yeah. doesn't really get at that, that's right. in Mark's question, but I wondered if, right. if there's, there must have been something on the part of the whoever wrote the survey that these were things that might have been there are present. So, you know, that's right. mm -hmm. um, I don't think that they did it, but I will look into it again. Yeah. What they did, oh, I have it later. Um, but they, <coughs> they ask them questions like, do you avoid going to some places and then of, uh, because of anti-Semitism? Mm -hmm. Or do you avoid uh, wearing any uh, signs that uh, make other people identify you as a Jew? Uh, 
so this is more direct, but not a, I don't think they made a hierarchization of, um, of the tropes. That's right, yeah. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Um, so, but we see that it is, um, it is a worry for many Jews in Europe, um, and these the Holocaust denial is one of them, or this um, uh, stereotype that Jews allegedly would exploit the Holocaust to victimhood um, is what you know, worries of many see this as anti Semitic. Um, then to, to move on, who are actors? So, who are responsible for anti Semitic acts? <coughs> Stereotypes are widespread in general. Yeah, if you, there are surveys <coughs> in the general population, and I don't have time to go into these surveys. Um, so it's always difficult. I think the uh, these surveys. Um, it's again, we have to see that as an indication. But what we see, if we ask people, do you agree with this and that stereotype? Do you agree that Jews are rich or um, or Jews exploit the Holocaust for their own purposes, then we get uh, high numbers of agreement in different European countries, and the differences are quite high between the different European countries, and it's not always the same in the same year. Um, so it's complicated, but we see that um, this is not only minority, uh, it is widespread. We have numbers of um, that Jews would exploit the Holocaust uh, for their own purposes of 50% in some countries in the general average population. People believe this, uh, 50 or more. Um, uh, so it is, um, it is relevant in the general population that you have answered your beliefs, but not everybody, of course, acts upon their belief. And if you answer a question in the survey, it's also kind of an act doesn't mean necessarily that you show hostility towards um, your Jewish colleagues, for example, or neighbors. But there are incidents, and um, there are um, more and more like anecdotal incidents, maybe, that even in Germany, for example, Jewish uh, newspapers, now they, the main uh, Jewish newspapers do, do not send the newspaper anymore, as all newspapers do, just the newspaper itself, but they put it in an envelope. So it's not, you cannot see that there is a Jewish newspaper in this envelope. Hmm. Um, and this is because there, um, those who, are <coughs> who get it sent, they told them, oh, I don't, I like your newspaper, but I don't want to have it sent to my home because my neighbors would say that I'm really a huge undermine. And there were incidents that um, people were attacked, or there were some signs on the doors and so on. So this is anecdotal evidence, incidents, but we see have, we have some statistics, of course, also from the police about, um, about more serious incidents. Because, of course, if somebody uh, feels that he doesn't want his neighbors to know that he reads a Jewish newspaper, it's not necessarily an incident he would report to the police, of course. Okay. Um, so we have it from the general society, and then we have something uh, which is of controversial, um, widespread anti-Zionist beliefs. So what is anti-Zionism? It's, it's, a, it's, um, it's a huge debate. But what it certainly means for many people that Zionism would be something very bad. And it has even become in some uh, um, circles a kind of insult to be a Zionist. Um, and that you can also see in, in, uh, in many newspapers, many media, that Zionism or Israel in general is uh, perceived as something negative. And that can often be connected to um, anti-Semitic feelings, or when it's connected, 
um, it has a very direct impact uh, into Jews because Jews are generally suspected to be Zionists or full <coughs> Israel. So it's a general accusation against them. If there's a demonization of Israel, which is uh, something very different from criticism of Israeli policies, if there's a demonization of Israel, and um, Jews are seen as um, being an alliance which has demonized Israel, then it often affects Jews directly. And that turns out to be um, uh, the case in attacks against uh, Jewish synagogues or Jewish Jews on the street. Um, when some of the perpetrators argue in the uh, in a anti Zionist or uh, way that they show hatred against Israel, but they attack Jews that live there in Berlin or Paris or Toulouse or wherever, and that are, of course, not responsible for anything that the Israel government or some particular soldiers do uh, or do not do. Um, so <coughs> we have, we have this, um, this has a connection there. Um, then we have, um, we can identify different um, or perpetrators with different backgrounds. We have traditionally... Sorry, yeah. can I interrupt before you move on to the Muslim? Um, do you have specific examples for uh, um, the policies regarding Israel or impact on textbooks? Uh, yeah. Um, Just what you have a parenthesis there. Yes, I mean, it, maybe the, the phrasing of it is not uh, the best, but um, you have, there is a study now came out uh, months ago about uh, the image of Israel in textbooks. And uh, that shows that there's a very biased approach to how Israel is portrayed in German textbooks. That was okay. a study on German textbooks. And we have, uh, there are many German textbooks, but um, and every of the lenders use different textbooks. Um, and the schools sometimes use different textbooks. But um, there were very few where there's a non-biased view, not only of the israel palestinian conflict, but also uh, about Israel in general. Um, so this is something what uh, so this is a negative bias? Negative bias, yeah, negative bias towards Israel. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and well, so different, um, different um, groups of perpetrators. The extreme right is traditionally um, anti-Semitic, and not only in Germany, but also of course in France and also in Britain. Um, they have, <coughs> to some extent, in uh, the, the French far right, um, uh, is uh, uh, trying to uh, portray themselves as not anti-Semitic, but their membership is very anti-Semitic, as surveys have shown, and even as um, some of their local candidates um, have shown when they are seen on, on Facebook with a with a swastika, all these kind of things. So anti-Semitism, even among the French far right, has not gone away, even if they, or Marine Le Pen tries to portray herself as, as uh, not anti-Semitic, um, but this is still, the, the anti-Semitism from the far right is, um, is still high. Um, part of the radical left um, also, um, um, show anti-Semitic um, um, not only attitudes but also action um, and also part of the Muslim communities and we can see that um, in some of the even some of the statistics uh, so we have these statistics for France for example these are the uh, Figures by the by the French government, and they distinguished in this period from 1999 to 2011. Um, they published the 
uh, background of the perpetrators. And they had what you see in green there is the, are the perpetrators um, they classified as um, of Arab or Muslim origin. And what you see in the middle is yellow is what is uh, perpetrators who were not identified, or the background was not identified. And on the top, the gray <coughs> part is with um, uh, percentage of perpetrators, or not the, the, the total acts of um, uh, the total perpetrators of um, anti-Semitic acts coming from the far right. Yeah, just a real quick question. From that previous slide and then this one about the, the left, the far left, um, what kind of anti-Semitic things were the far left saying? Because it doesn't seem to be that they're on the violence right. graph. So right. how was their angle? That's right. Often from the, uh, from the extreme left, um, it's, uh, it shows an anti-Zionist form. Um, and that's often debated how that is, um, how that um, is that really anti-Semitic or is it not anti-Semitic? It's a, as I said, this anti-Zionist tropes is a, it's a huge debate. Is it's it because it's becoming coming across as very pro-Palestinian? Mm, well, it would be more than pro-Palestinian. It would be attacking Jewish communities. I mean, if you are pro-Palestinian, that I mean, why should that be anti-Semitic? Um, so it needs something that is against uh, Jews or Jewish communities. Um, yeah. So, but you're right, it doesn't come up here in these figures, but it comes up in German figures that there is um, people who are affiliated to the far left organizations, um, act up on it and uh, take it out on, on Jews in even violent acts. Um, yeah, it's always a discussion, is that then absolutely good? I think if somebody attacks a Jew directly, there are good chances that this is anti-Semitic. Not <laughs> always. <laughs> good chances. Okay, but this is this is a uh, marginal. But there are more. But the the question how anti-Semitism is expressed is very interesting because it's very different for many different um, uh, for the perpetrators. There is a, um, a great study now from from Germany published uh, one or two years ago. Um, they uh, got all the letters and emails sent to the uh, German Jewish Community Council and to the um, uh, Israeli Embassy in Germany, and they analyzed all the letters and all the emails. And uh, so some were very openly anti-Semitic, and some even were openly anti-Semitic and put their names in there. So they could see the names are even profession, and so they could see uh, where it's coming from. And I mean, writing these letters, you have I had here this category of um, part of Muslim communities. Um, there were very, very few who, um, who would be identifiable of coming from the Muslim community in these anti-Semitic letters, um, and also. Um, very few who would have an Islamist ideology attached to it in these letters. But if you look on the numbers of anti-Semitic attacks or violent attacks, uh, it's different. Or if you look <coughs> onto um, uh, desecration of cemeteries, this is a field for the far right. Not only, not exclusively, but predominantly this is people from the far right or neo-Nazi affiliated people do this. Or they kind of have their own <laughs> specialties <laughs> and how they express their uh, um, Again, for the background, I mean, in this survey, um, where the 6,000 European Jews were asked about the experiences of anti-Semitism, they were also asked what they think are the background of the perpetrators of the most serious anti-Semitic violence or threats. So there you have some indication that Muslims are a, a strong group of perpetrators. They have teenagers, they had <coughs> more than uh, these categories here, and they're not really systematic. 
views us with one category. Um, interestingly, here you can see the left wing uh, perpetrators, um, or perpetrators, they think they were from the left, or far left. It's an indication, I don't really know, but it surprised me that there were more than the, uh, from, from the far right. I don't really know why that is, but this is the experience that the answers they gave, and we now have to investigate why is that. Um, so, yeah. I think if you break that down by country, you might see different things, right? This is overall those countries. <coughs> I mean, probably in Latvia, you wouldn't have the first category of Muslims, because <laughs> there are no Muslims in Latvia. Uh, well, I don't know, but in, in the United Kingdom might be even bigger. Mm. This is something I say, I ask them to give me these numbers for the specific countries. They have oh, they you haven't had that. Oh. No, not yet, but I'm, uh, I won't give up. <laughs> uh, but because, yeah, this is the same, I have the same thought, that must be different in different countries. Uh, mm. uh, well, we sh I think we can. We should leave it there. There's just some figures, and didn't show up very nicely here, for France, of anti-Semitic attitudes, and they compare different um, or groups that they would identify differently. It's always self-identification here, by the way. So this was a survey um, where there were self-identified Muslims and self-identified sympathizers with the Front National. So right and from the gauche and then the general population and we see that the numbers for different I put down also the six this were the six questions they asked and they uh, or six anti-semitic statements and we see an agreement um, there from the uh, people who are sympathizers of the Front National which is not very surprising but the those with Muslim backgrounds, they, um, they, they're almost the same numbers or some, some, for some question they don't higher than those of synthesis of the Front National. That was surprising for me. Uh, we also hear a question about the, the far left. It's also higher than the general population for uh, all of the, uh, these six anti-Semitic statements. Um, anyway, this this is just one case that um, brings together people from the left, from the far right, from the very extreme far right, um, and general population. And we have some cases like in Judone Mbala Mbala is his uh, name. Um, these are um, cases, I mean, he's the most prominent one, but we have some other public figures or uh, artists who, who um, very openly voice anti-Semitism. Um, and he, um, he's, he was very, or is still successful as a stand-up comedian. Um, he is aligned with the uh, very far right, with the uh, Front National and even more right than the Front National and you see here on this picture uh, this guy here, Alain Soral, he's uh, one of the main um, extreme right, um, well he's not really intellectual but he writes a lot um, <laughs> <coughs> and he's uh, his positions are often taken up, and he was a consultant for the uh, for the Front National, but the Front National was not right enough for him, so he left it and founded a party together with Giovanni. And the previous party is the uh, anti Zionist list, um, and they stood for elections and European elections. They didn't get many voters, um, but they are successful, or Giordone is very successful also in disseminating his ideas uh, in small YouTube videos. And he gets hits of a million, a million hits for some of his YouTube uh, videos. And when he's accused of, of, 
oh yeah, this is the, he takes it in a way saying, well, I'm only making fun of everything. So he invites Holocaust mm -hmm. deniers to his show and uh, he has a show on Holocaust denial. Uh, one of his um, bad guests was Forreston um, in, in 2006 already. And he also invented this gesture called the La Canelle. Um, you can see all this, we can see these two here making this gesture and here he's making this gesture as well. Um, this reminds many of a Nazi salute, which is not quite, the hands are quite up. Mm. And this is also very popular among uh, many young people and that do this and take a selfie in front of many different places. Um, most prominently there was, uh, I think Anelka was his name, a football player uh, in the UK, Premier League football player. Um, and so he, I think he could find or expel for that for some time or so. Um, because it's, it has an anti-Semitic um, message um, that is sometimes denied, but one incident, one, one indicator that's an anti-Semitic message is, for example, this young man, this is in front of this Jewish school in Toulouse where the anti-Semitic uh, violent terrorist attacks um, happened. Um, and we have also other of these selfies taken, for example, in Auschwitz. Um, and so there is, what they say, this is a, this is a gesture against the establishment something against the establishment. But then often it's taken in front of Jewish um, organizations, buildings, uh, housing Jewish organizations, schools. So if that is meant to be anti-establishment, that would then say that they think that the Jews are the establishment. So in any case, it has an anti-Semitic uh, connotation. Um, well, we, but we also have, I mean, I promised uh, on that, but we won't have time to go into um, these in more detail. But we also have, of course, many Muslims who speak out against anti-Semitism. And um, this is um, didn't focus so much on, on Muslim anti-Semitism here, but um, the figures show that this also has to be taken serious, um, as serious as anti-Semitism from the far right, um, maybe left. Uh, anti-Semitism, left-wing, motivated anti-Semitism, maybe, which is uh, smaller than, I agree, smaller than from the far right. Um, but we have, um, so we have uh, people in the Muslim communities who um, are responsible of disseminating hatred, and these are not only Islamists, but um, in Islamist theory, um, ideology, I would say, in Islamist ideology, anti-Semitism is a prominent feature. All the Islamist writers, thinkers, like uh, Kutub and others, uh, were fierce anti-Semites. And their literature is available in mosques that, they, that are <coughs> affiliated to Islamist organizations, such as the Muslim Brotherhood or Mili Gurish in Germany. Um, and others. But we also have many, as I said, Muslims who do not accept or not only Islamist uh, interpretations of, um, of Islam, um, but who also speak out against anti-Semitism and also against anti-Zionism. And um, I just we could go through this list, but I think one of the most interesting people here is Ahmed Mansour. he's uh, now in Germany, he's from, he's a Palestinian Israeli, um, and came to, and studied in, uh, in Tel Aviv, and came to Germany, um, and observed um, anti-Semitism, and, um, and also um, uh, sexism within uh, what he saw as um, families from, uh, from the Middle East, or Muslim families, and he has now uh, initiated a number of um, 
organizations in Germany that work with young people to question uh, these kind of beliefs. And, and this is uh, maybe not enough, but it's one very outspoken <coughs> critique um, of um, not only of, of anti-Semitism, but also about um, justifications for saying these uh, hostile beliefs of Jews can be just justified by anything that goes on in the, in the Middle East or uh, in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Um, yes, maybe I, I don't go into these because that will lead to many other um, discussions. Um, I think we should. We don't have much time now. I'm sorry that I over. Yes. Um, thank Indeed. you very much for listening, yeah. and I hope we still have some time.